Okay, well, let's, let's continue. We want to go to Hebrews chapter 5. Uh, let's continue this portion, and hopefully we can get through with it tonight. And we're dealing with the, with the topic of the triumph of faith. And uh, we're, the subtitle that we're dealing with is, is being able to, to stand, standing in faith, or another word is, is remaining steadfast in faith. And we talked about quite a bit of that last week, and so we're going we're gonna to just kind of try to conclude this portion of it this week. What I want us to do tonight is, uh, let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse, um, verse 13, it says, For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he is obeyed, but strong meat belongs to them that are full of age, full grown, uh, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And the, the uh, scripture that we based our study on that we talked about last week was chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, where it says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. The writer here is saying not that uh, principles are not, or foundational principles are not necessary. And of course, you understand that the basics are always necessary. The foundation for anything, for marriage, for life, for success, Foundation is essential in everything that we do. So the writer here is not minimizing the need for the foundation, but what the writer is telling the, the, uh, the Hebrew Christians is that you can't keep going back and digging up the foundation and laying it again. You, you need to build off of the foundation and not keep going back. So the inference here is that they're not moving forward. They're not moving on to perfection, or a better word for perfection is they're not moving on to full development or maturity in Christ. And that's what they need to do. They kept coming back to these, and like I tell you, these Hebrew Christians were contemplating going back to what? Going back to the ceremonial law of Moses, going back to offering animals and all of that. When the, uh, when the, the truth came, or Jesus has come, which means that that was done away with. And because of all of this, they kept thinking about going back and reverting back to what was. And so the, the writer here is telling them, hey, look, you, you, need to, you need to continue to develop me now. You need to take what you have learned and what that means in, in, in light of who Christ is and now build off of that and move on to maturity or development in the kingdom. And probably one of the great needs of the church today is for Christians to develop. It's for Christians to mature. It's for them to mature from being a baby, a toddler, a baby, a toddler, uh, an adult, or I should say a teenager, into adulthood. And what that infers for you and I is that when we move into maturity, then God is able to release to us. And I think that's the that ought to be the hope and the desire of every believer that when God when we move into maturity, God is able to release the blessings or the benefit that He has called you and I to do. He's He's able to release to you and I. We call it destiny. That's what we say. We call it destiny. Moving in your destiny, which means that you are matured enough that God could turn the rain, so to speak, over to you for you to handle the ministry or the call, the anointing, the things that God has ordained in your life. All right? And one of the only things that keep those things from happening is when people do not develop. Okay? So look at this here. It says here in, um, let's look at some scriptures. Okay? Look at Jeremiah 12. Jeremiah 12 and verse 5. 
Jeremiah 12 and verse 5. Jeremiah 12 and verse 5. Uh, the King James Version of it, it says this. It says, if you have, if you have run with the footmen and they have wearied thee. Look at what he said. If you had run with the footmen and they have wearied thee, then how would you contend with horses? And if in the land of peace where you trust, they weary you, then how will you do in the swelling of the Jordan? Real simple, what God is saying is, if the little stuff gets you off, if the little things in your life makes you lose it, then how are you going to contend with when th greater things than that happen in your life? See? If, if, the, if the minute thing, if you and I have not developed, that's the whole concept of it, if you have not developed to where these little trials or small trials come into you, if you have not learned how to deal with these things to where it doesn't ruffle your feathers to where you lose your peace, your joy, and all of these things. And you know, sometimes people lose all of this stuff to where they blast you out, they lose control of themselves. God says that if, if, if the small things have come and they have taken such control of your life to cause you to do these things, he said, how are you going to contend when greater things than this happen in your life? So the whole purpose or the whole cue to this that God is saying then is development, right? The, the whole thing that God is saying is maturity. What do you mean maturity? Well, maturity is when, you, when you're young in the Lord and certain things happen, they easily ruffle your feathers. You easily go off in your emotions. You, you easily want to tell somebody where they ought to get off. When you begin to develop in God, what do you mean develop? When the Word of God begins to have such a place in your life to where your actions now are more on the word and you are not so quick to what? To give in to your flesh or to what you feel. You see what I'm saying? Now you are starting to take life by the neck. Now you're starting to take life by the throat, so to speak. In other words, what happens in life doesn't control you. Amen. You see what I'm saying? I'm not saying it's not real. I'm not saying you don't hurt because you hurt, I hurt. That's not what the Bible is saying. But the Bible is saying is if you lose your mind with the small things, what's going to happen when big things happen? Well, where are you going to stand? If, if these people talked about you and you have lost all your peace, then how are you going to contend if I put you in a ministry and you've got visibility and Thousands of people calling you everything under the sun and they're printing your name in the paper and talking bad about you. God said, how are you going to hold up there? You, you get what he's saying? Yeah. Hey, if the footmen weary you, then how would you contend with the horses? How would you run with the horses? In essence then is that we've got to develop. We have to grow in the Lord. I think one of the, I think one of the worst things that happened to us and, and, and religion does that. Churchianity does that. Is that we, we, we go to church and for some reason we don't equate life with God and the Bible. We equate the Bible with Sunday morning. And we equate the Bible with Wednesday night or Thursday night. We don't equate the Bible with living. God didn't give us all of this for us to have this as a religious book. That we pick it up when we go to church and it's on the table the rest of the week. You, you and I could never expect to grow in God that way. The Bible is a book for us to learn to read and to activate in our life. It's supposed to take on our flesh. The word of God took on flesh. It's supposed to take on our flesh. We are supposed to live by the power of the Holy Spirit according to the word of God, okay? So now, jump back to Hebrews chapter 5 and look at this. We're in the same vein of growing in the Lord, growing in God. If there's ever a need today for the church, it's for believers, the pews. 
Not just the preacher, the people in the pew. We got this wrong. Sometimes churches we are we are uh, uh, adoring and 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 uh, to some uh, to some degree worship the leader. And the people in the pews, you wonder what's what's going on with them. What's happening with them? We got this all wrong. God gave five gifts, and he didn't give those five gifts for those gifts to be worshipped. He gave those five gifts for the body to grow, for the body to develop, and the body to mature. Look at Hebrews chapter 5, and look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. It says, it says So also Christ glorified not Glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, You are my son, today I have begotten thee. As he said also in another place, thou, a, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And he said, Who in the days of his flesh, when he, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying. This is Jesus now. Strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Listen to this, verse 8. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. Verse 9 then says, watch this now. Verse 9, because he learned obedience by the things he suffered, Verse 9 said, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Now what the Bible is not saying, this is what it's not saying. It is not saying that God gives you sickness or disease or causes you to suffer in order to perfect you. That's not what this is saying. Okay, that's not what this scripture is saying. There are, if you were to look it up, there are many words in the Bible when you're talking about suffering, okay? And sometimes in our mind, when we read the word, he suffered, we're thinking, oh God, look, you see, so, so God does do, do all of this and, and make us go through all sorts of diseases. You hear people talk about Paul with the, with the uh, uh, a thorn in the flesh and how he had pus running out of his eyes and all this other stuff. But, but understand this, what the Bible here is saying is that although Jesus was a son, in the face of suffering, that's what it's saying, although he was a son, and you can look it up in your Strong's Concordance, okay, the word here is Pasho, P-A-S-C-H-O, I believe it's 3958 in your Strong Concordance book. And it means to suffer or be vexed. Now, you and I know Jesus didn't have cancer. He didn't have tumors. He didn't have all of these things. So what suffering did Jesus go through? There was one specific suffering that the Bible is referring here to. And that's the suffering when he was handed over to the chief priests. Okay? And the scripture says here that although he was a son, Okay, although he was a son, he learned obedience or another way of putting this is that Jesus in the midst of suffering, he remained constant in his faith. Amen. That's what it is saying, you see? And as he remained constant in his faith, as he remained constant in his suffering, the Bible said he learned obedience or he continued to obey. He learned, he learned to, to stay firm, to stay steady with God. Huh? When things are happening in your life that you don't understand, you don't know why, you don't go off and walk away from God. You don't, you don't charge God foolishly and turn away from God and say, this stuff don't work. See, that person had learned obedience. That person had learned how to stay steady in the midst of what's going on in their life because their faith and their trust is in the God of heaven. You see, you see what I'm saying? So Jesus remained steady. He learned obedience. As a son, he remained obedient to the Father in the midst of his suffering, 
in the midst of them cursing him and calling him, plucking the hair out of his out of his the beard, out of the hair out of his face, uh, slapping him, hitting him with rods. He never what? He never turned away from his father. He stayed steady with his father. You remember I told you when I when I uh I went through a very difficult time in my life and God proposed a question to me and he asked me, because you don't understand, are you gonna walk away from me? Are you gonna leave me because things are not adding up to what you think I ought to do or when I ought to do it? You see, where is your faith? Our faith has to be more in just things. Our faith has to be in the person of God. You got to know him. That's what your faith is for you to come into a, an, an, a, a living experience with God. Where you understand the nature and the character of who God is. You understand it to such a place that when events in your life are contrary, you don't curse God. And when I say curse, you don't turn from God and say, well, maybe God don't love me. You understand the nature. You understand who God is and what God is and what God says that he would do. You understand that. And so God grows us up in that. The Holy Spirit brings us to him and we begin to learn about him. And as you're in the word, you grow up in learning and knowing who God is. And it's got to be that way, friend. It's got, your faith has got to go further then God just giving you a piece of bread and meeting your needs or putting a Cadillac in your, in, in your garage. All those things are fine. Giving you a nice home, all those things are fine. But listen to me, God is no different in Africa. Our brothers and sisters that are suffering, that don't have anything, God's no different. His word is the same. His nature is the same. You see, he remains the same. Am I making sense? You making sense? He, he, he remains the same. Yes, amen. Look at, now, now listen to this. This same word, this same word that's translated suffering here is the same word in Matthew 16, 21 that says, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders, chief priests, and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. That's the same word suffering there. You see, he's not talking about sickness and disease. You say, why, why, do, you, why do you harp on that? So, because there's so many people that believe that God put these diseases on them to make them humble or, or to teach them something. But my Bible says, my Bible says that Jesus bore the curse for us. Amen. Galatians 3.13, he said, Christ has redeemed us. The word redeemed, Stephanie, is the word bought back. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. The curse of the law is that God says, you have to do this, 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 and this. And if you don't do this, 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 and this, the way I want you to, this is the punishment that you will, that you will incur. That's the curse of the law. And you see, because we could not do it, Romans 8 tell us that the, the law was perfect. The fallacy and the problem, the weakness was the weakness of man. Man could not live up to the laws of God. And because we couldn't live up to it, then what was the end result? The curse. And what was the curse? The curse was poverty. The curse was sickness. And ultimately separation from God. So Christ came and he bore the curse. Watch the curse that he bore. He became poor for us. They, they lashed him on his back so that all of our sicknesses and wounds would be healed. And he was separated from the father for a season. He went to hell so that you and I don't have to go. He bore our penalty so that we don't have to. So listen to me now. So if Christ did that for us, so you don't have to bear it. So God could not be telling you here that he puts the disease on us in order to help us or to bring us somewhere. You see, Christ, the Bible could not be saying that. You see that? It could not be saying that though he was a son, he learned obedience. He could not be talking about Jesus uh, uh, filled with disease and sickness and all this. That's not what he's saying. 
Are you following me? That's not what the Bible is teaching us here. Okay? So listen. It said, from that time forth began Jesus to show his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Let's look at another scripture. The same word for suffering is in 1 Peter 2.21. Same word. For even hereunto were you called. Because here it is. Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his footsteps. So now, so now, if that's true, then Christ is not leaving us an example that we ought to have disease eating up our body and we just ought to be patient because God somehow is trying to teach us something. No, what the, the thing that, God, that Jesus has taught us is that we can be faithful to God in the midst of difficulty. This is what, this is the lesson Jesus taught us, is that we can be constant with the Father. Why? Because you know that he's going to come to your rescue. Amen. You know that if it doesn't happen in the morning, you can go to sleep and rest comfortably knowing that God knows who you are, that even the hairs on your head are numbered, and that God is not going to leave you out. Is that right? I said, is that right? Y'all help me in here. Amen. <laughs> you, you, folks, you folks on Facebook, help me out too. And those of you on the phone, help me out here. You see, we, Jesus taught us that we could be constant with God. Hold your place there. There's a scripture coming to me. Hold your place. Don't, 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 just hold your place right there in chapter 5. I'm not going anywhere. But look at this. In, in chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of God. Now watch this. Verse 3 said, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. Amen. You see that? He said, he said, consider Jesus. Consider how Jesus, by the strength of the Spirit, underwent the, the trial and the difficulty that he was to undergo in order for us to be saved. He said, consider him when you are dealing with trials and difficulties in your mind. Consider Jesus. Go back and consider how he stayed constant with the Father. How his faith kept him with the Father. How he would not relent. He would not turn back. He would not give up. He hung in there with what the Father said. And he saw the Father raise them from the dead by virtue of his faith. He said, you consider Jesus when you're going through your difficulty and remember that there is triumph that comes in your faith. This is what the Bible is teaching us here. All right? All right. Uh, okay. Look at verse, same scripture, same chapter, 1 Peter 2. Look at verse 23. Who, when he was reviled, see that? He reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. But what did he do? He committed himself to him that judges righteously. Look at what Jesus, this was the mentality of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he was, when he could have called fire down, so to speak, and destroyed them. He didn't do that. He turned around and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Why is this important? Come on, we live in a real world. Huh? We have difficulties. People do us wrong. Sometimes you, you know, somebody do you something, and your hand, your hand, anybody ever felt this but me? Your, your, your fingers begin to curl up and make a fist. Anybody, be, anybody ever experienced that? Or oh, it's just me. Your fingers start curling up and seem like they want to make a fist. And you have to look at your hand and say, stop that down there. You, you want to knock that person out. Are you listening to me? We have, we have feelings. We have emotions. People do us wrong. You see what I'm saying? And the Bible teaches you and I, not that you become a doormat. You don't become a doormat. We're, we're believers. We, we haven't lost our mind, okay? We're, we're Christians. You can stand up, but you do things God's way. You do it God's way. Whatever way that is, whatever situation is in, 
I, I had an individual one time that was giving me a headache. Just, just, just. I, boy, I tell you what, I, I, I did everything. I sent stuff to that person. Uh, 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 super, I did all kind of stuff in order to say, look, I need this stuff to stop. And ain't not what working. And the Lord one day in prayer said to me, he said, you handling that wrong. So, well, why don't you lose a little honey? <laughs> Use a little honey. I, I want you to deal with that person different. And so, and so, you know what? I told the person, say, you know what? I, I, I'm going to pray for you. And I start praying for him. And I, and I just, I just said, you know, I would just give him a nice, kind word. And just, Amen. just, I'm praying for you. And you know what happened? We became best friends. Amen. <laughs> Right. Person start taking care of me. All the stuff that was giving me problems, Amen. that stop. Right. Amen. See, it, 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 one hat doesn't fit everything. You got to listen to the Lord. Yeah. got to hear what God's telling you. Jesus handled his difficulty the way God wanted him to. Amen. See, and that's how we have to do this. You see, he reviled not. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. 1 Peter 3 and 14 says, but, but and if you suffer for righteousness sake. He's not talking about sickness and disease here. He's not talking about having cancer. That's not what he's talking about. If you got cancer in your body, fight that thing. He said, if you got sickness, fight it. That's not what he's talking about. If you suffer for righteousness, that's persecution, that's trouble. Amen. He said, happy are you. Why? And don't be afraid for their terror, neither be troubled. Amen. He said, if folks are coming against you because of what you're dealing with or what God has told you to do, he said, don't worry about it. Do you remember? Do you remember in, uh, in Acts chapter 7? Do you remember... When, when the Bible talks about Stephen, and when Stephen, the Bible talks about how, I don't want to go here because I don't want to get off track, but, but when, when, when Stephen was being persecuted, Amen. and he looked at them full of the Holy Ghost, Amen. and told them what God said, and you remember how they rushed on him, and the Bible said they wanted to eat him alive, right. and, and they took Stephen and began to stone him. Now, now you see what I'm talking about? That right there, while, while they stoning me, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you picking up stones at them too. Amen. And so I'm going to hit one of you before I die. You know what I'm saying? Stephen didn't do that. Amen. Stephen, the Bible said, heaven was open. Watch this now. And he saw Jesus get up off of his throne. Woo, oh, Jesus. Are y'all with me? <laughs> Woo! Heaven was open and Jesus got up off of his throne. Now, there, there are many reasons why Jesus got up. He said, I see heaven open and I see Jesus standing. There's many reasons, okay? Uh, but you know what? I, I think you can, you can viably say that Jesus stood up to receive that man. His standing, his standing also implied, it implied how God was so pleased with Stephen. Listen to me. He stood up, and you know, you can also say that Jesus probably let Stephen know, don't worry about them, they're mine. I'll deal with them. I'll handle them. You see what I'm saying? But Jesus, Jesus stood up because of how Stephen. Hallelujah. See? Stephen was honoring the Lord. When you and I move by the word, that's what you're doing. Even if in the process people talk bad about you. You don't have to go after them. God will deal with them. Listen, listen, listen. If, 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 if they curse Jesus while he was on the cross. Hear me now. If they cursed him while he was on the cross. And the best he could do was say, Father, forgive them. What make you think because they curse you, God is going to burn them up? <laughs> see, you see what I'm saying? And what if God would have burnt you and I up when we cursed somebody out before we were saved? Amen. Are you following me? Jesus wants to help these people. Those that he has to deal with differently, he's God, he'll handle it. But 
Don't think everybody comes up against you. God's just wanting to burn them up. No. no. God wants to reach them. And sometimes your action and my action become a testimony. And so that's all of us sometimes have to say while we're on the road, Lord, help me. Uh huh. Help me. You know what I'm saying? That, that lady driving slow, that man driving slow, and you're, eh, eh, get out of my. You know what I'm saying? God have to like, help me, Jesus. So listen to that. Growing up then in God has nothing to do with age, natural age. Growing up in God has nothing to do with how old you are. See, there are people that's old in years and are young in spirit. It has nothing to do with that. Okay? Growing, listen to this. Growing up in God is much more than that. Let me show you. I got Bible for you. Let me show you. Just follow me in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 5. Go to Hebrews chapter 5. Growing up in God has much more than that to do. Hebrews 5, look at verse 12. It says, for when, for the time, you ought to be teachers. He said, he said, the writer said, at this point in your Christian experience, talking to the Hebrews, you should be the ones doing what I'm doing. Amen. He said, you ought to be teaching. You see, but, but he said, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and you are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. Now, now hear me good. Hear me good. Listen to me. There's nothing wrong with you and I needing milk. All right? There's nothing wrong with it because, hey, you could be at an age or a point in your Christian world where you need milk. I am not knocking milk. What I am doing is saying that you can stay Amen. in the place where all you do is take milk. You have to come into a place where you can now chew meat. When our kids were small, sometimes my wife would do, if they wanted a piece of the meat that we had, you take that meat and you chew it for them. And then you give it to that baby and the baby would finish chewing it. But if you gave it to the baby, the way, you know, after it's cooked that way, the way you're eating it, you'll choke that baby because that baby don't have the necessary things in our mouth in order to digest that food. Amen. You're following me? Amen. So milk is essential. But you have to come to a point where if you got teeth in your mouth, why is somebody chewing your food for you? You follow me? And so now, let's bring this to where we understand it. What do you mean? Well, here he tells you what. He said, for everyone that uses milk is what? Is un skillful. Now, here it is. He's telling you what milk is. He said, when you take milk, you're a new Christian. You hadn't learned the things of God yet. You hadn't learned how to stand on your own feet yet. Okay? Let me see. I think I got this in the Message Bible. I think I got it here in the Message Bible. Yeah, yeah, here it is. Well, no, 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 no. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's see, let's see. I should have it in the message Bible on here. Hallelujah. Okay, here it is. Here it is. Okay, he says here, he said, I have a lot more to say about this, but it is hard to get it across to you since you've picked up this bad habit of not listening. <laughs> By this time, you ought to be teachers yourself. Yet, here I find you need someone to sit down with you and go over the basics on God again, starting from square one, baby's milk. When you should have been on solid food long ago, milk is for beginners inexperienced in God's ways. Solid food is for the mature who have some practice in telling right from wrong. Now, y'all see that? Amen. So here's what he's saying. Here's what he's saying. He's saying that there has to come a point in your life. And listen to me. This point doesn't come because you go to church and you read your Bible 
and you go home, and then after Sunday or Thursday, you have nothing to do with your Bible until Sunday or Thursday again. That's not what he's talking about. He's not even talking about that you and I just read our Bible. That's not what he's saying. How about y'all? Y'all listening to me out there? That's not what he's saying. He's talking about more than that. He's talking about, hear me now, he's talking about in your everyday life, you use the word of God in your own life and circumstances. Yes. Amen. You use the word, and by you using the word, you learn how to use it. I've never found a swordsman that is skillful in using a sword become skillful by having the sword hanging on his wall. Amen. Huh? Amen. A fishing buddy never becomes a good fisherman by having the fishing rod in his house and never going out on the water. Huh? Are you all with me? You never become good at math by just looking at math and not getting your head into it and working hard at it to become anything that you become good at in life. It means that you have what? You have done it over and over and over and over. Michael Jordan is the, considered the best basketball player today. Not because he was just born with skills. He was born with skills, but he had to hone those skills. And he honed those skills by probably practicing more than the average person. By shooting more than the average person. By practicing over and over and over. And when we saw him on TV, you saw what all those times of practice produced. Yes. Are you following me? Amen. So, so you know, his, his shooting average was at such because he kept shooting every minute in practice. They say Stephen Curry, one of th this guy that has basically changed the league now, the amount of shots that he would put up in order to make these three pointers. Think about it. Nobody becomes skillful or good at something by haphazardly doing it once in a while. So, why do you think? <laughs> oh, why do you think? You and I would become good at the word of God by using it once in a while. Doesn't work that way. You see, the person who is on meat is the person who by reason of use, that means that they utilize the word consistently in their life. It's a progression. When I first got saved, I did. I didn't know how. I had tutors and teachers that taught me. And little by little, you keep doing that. And so you take the word and you use it in your marriage. You use it in your personal life. You use it in how you do business. You use it here. You use it there. And what happened? You progress and you go, you go, you go, you go. Until the word of God, you come to a place where you don't make a move unless you seek God's counsel. You don't do any unless... God's word says it. You, you, you follow what I'm saying? You, 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 you order your decision, your choices, the things that you do by the word of God. Now watch me now. The more you do it, you begin to see how it works for you. The more you use it. <laughs> Are you listening to me? So, so when you first start using it, the devil may have hit you upside your head. And you didn't quit. You said, ah, I did something wrong here. What did I do wrong? Holy Ghost, what I did wrong? And the Holy Ghost said, well, you needed to do this here. He said, okay. And you come back and you use it. And after a while, you realize the first devil that shows up in your house, you know how to give him a headache. You know how to put it on him to where he leads you alone. You ain't got to call the pastor. Now, you may call him sometime when you need someone to, to, to agree with you in prayer. But you don't have to call him for your headaches and your little problems. Why? Because by reason of use, by reason of use, you have exercised yourself. 
And now you know how to discern. You know how to know what's right from what's wrong. It doesn't matter what culture say. It doesn't matter what people say. It matters what the word of God say. And you use it. You're in this book so much. Oh, no. They, yeah, yeah, they say that. But that's not what the word say. Oh, no, I can't do that. No, no, that's... That's not right. That's not, somebody said, well, man, you, 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 you really, you, you really, you got a ton of vision. You're small minded. Small minded? Small minded? Hello? Small minded? Are you, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I, I'm just like you. I've been out there just like you. And I, I don't know of a day that the devil helped me yet. I'm just like you. Know, I ain't got no angel wings. I was a sinner just like you, needed help just like you, and still need God's help. I have not found the devil to help me one day. Amen. Are you listening to me? And I've already tried some of that stuff out there. It don't work. It don't work. Hello. It don't work. We had, we had, I remember we had times where Friday night, we were waiting for Friday night. You're three P's down. Where you going? Going party. You party Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, you don't get up. There's no church for you. <laughs> oh, that's right. That, I would save all my life. That's right. What, what, what you out there partying? Looking for girls? Looking for a good time, mama? Are you listening to me? Trying to have a good time. And you know what? It never worked. It never worked. I don't care how much you drunk. All you end up with is a hangover. It didn't work. Monday morning, you had to face all your problems again. And you did that next Friday. Nothing changed, folks. Are you listening to me? Jesus works. Amen. The Bible works. Amen. It's not an outdated book. It's an advanced book. The Bible has science, math, you name it. It's all up in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's right, folks. I'm telling you right now. The Bible has it all. I, I have no clue. The only reason why the world may look at us so crazy is because we don't live this thing. Yeah. That's right. We don't live it. We don't do it. And so they're looking at us and they're wondering, what the world? And you talk about Jesus. What the world? I would be like that too. If the church can't love Folks, if we're in the church and we racially motivated, could you imagine the world? Hello? If, 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 if we got problems with people, ethnicity, economic status, all this other garbage, if we got problems with that, with one another, how in heaven name you going to tell the world? Of course they're going to be befuddled and confused and mesmerized. Because you're doing the same mess they're doing. How can you have the answer? But when they see us, Jesus said, by this, shall I, I, I told myself I would be cool tonight. <laughs> and it's just not working. It's just not working. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you have been tutored, you have been tutored, discipled, taught, and disciplined by me. He said, this is how they're going to know that you know me. You love each other. How should I love my brother and my sister? Jesus said, this is how you ought to love your brothers and sisters. The way I have loved you. Amen. That's what he said, mama. Amen. That's what he said. So if Jesus said that, how in the world you going to be racial? How in the world you don't... And, and you, you think the world is going to say, I need to go to your church. Excuse me. That's right. Excuse me. They, they might as well stay dancing with the devil. They're looking at the church. They're like, what's the difference? Where is the difference? I know this may not be too encouraging, but it's the truth. And we, we got to understand these things. Jesus said, Jesus said, strong meat belong to those who by reason of use. Yes. It's, not, it's not easy loving your enemy. Jesus don't expect us to do it. He'll do it through us. Amen. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? It, it, the word 
has to take on flesh. The word has to work through us to where people realize and see how this thing works. Amen. And see how it works. See? So when they look at us, we give to God, they ought to see you bless. Amen. When they talk about that tithe and stuff don't work, you come to my house. I'll show you if that tithe and stuff don't work. Come to my house. Let me talk to you five minutes. Let me let me show you if this tithe and stuff work or it don't work. They ought, you ought to be able to show. You ought to be able to show them how putting God first in your life works. Is that right? Is that right? God is not walking down Main Street. Jesus ain't walking down Main Street. Nobody can't see him. So how they how they gonna see him through you? That's how they see God. They see God in us. You want to know how we're blessed? Come to my house. I'll show you how blessed I am. God wants to do stuff like that. Folks, listen to me. God wants to do stuff like that. He want to pour it on us. And don't you sit there telling me that having money ain't God, ain't, ain't, ain't what God wants you to do. Because you, that, look, look, you fell off third law of thinking like that. Because we all need money to live on this earth. Hello, somebody. Hello. Yes. Don't, 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 now, now the love of money ain't good. It ain't good. God's supposed to be first. But you need money. And how it is that your daddy owns the whole world and you can't buy a pair of shoes? God, God want to change that. You following me? God changes us because he is seen through our lives. He's seen through our lives on every level and on every facet. God is seen through our lives. You may not have a million dollars in the bank, but you're taken care of. Your needs are supplied. You got the peace of God. You have the joy of the Lord. Why isn't you falling apart? And they want, If the world see it, they will inquire. Because you can't get that out there. Amen. Mm-hmm. It says, strong meat belong to them that are, watch this now, are full of age, full grown, who by reason of use, in other words, your maturity, your maturity develops as you learn to utilize the word of God in your life. That's how, that's how you become more mature in God. That, that's how God is able to release more into your life because he sees what you do. And, and listen to me, when you use the word and you see it work for you, can't nobody take that from you. Amen. Amen. Can't nobody. I, I was on the streets in New York preaching. And uh, I was preaching on the corner, man. And uh, <laughs> uh, God was saving folks, man, blessing them, healing them. And I remember this, this uh, Asian guy that came and, and, and the Lord touched him. And he got saved. And right there on the street, he began to speak. And the Lord filled them right on the corner. <laughs> filled them with the Holy Ghost, man. And this guy began to speak in tongues. He turned red. And right down from us, this guy from a religion was trying to tell him that tongues and all that's not for today. <laughs> the Asian guy turned red. I had to tell him, Calm down. Don't worry about it. Because he just experienced it. He just got it. And we didn't do it to him. God filled him. He, ex he experienced the presence and power of Christ. And here is this guy trying to talk him out that that is not for today and it's not real. Mm. See, when, when you do it, when you learn how to do it, nobody can take that from you. When you learn how to ride, I was riding, oh Lord, you want me to tell that too? Jesus. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I, I looked at this, this uh, uh, motorcycle and uh, they got this, this Honda that I was looking at it uh, years now. And I was, Lord, I, you know, I, I didn't like riding motorcycles because of something that happened with one of my family members. I didn't want to even be on one. But, you know, I don't know, maybe you're getting a little older, you know. I said, man, I like to do a few things a little different. So I, I used to say, Lord, I, I, I would like to have one of those motorcycles one day, you know. 
I like to get on them, and me and me and my girl here, we just ride sometimes. Just ride. It ain't no big thing. Just ride. And uh, when I came down here, man, I, I said, you know what? I'm, I'm going to go to this school, man, and uh, get my motorcycle license. I ain't never rode a motorcycle before. <laughs> so I got on this motorcycle, and they're teaching you, right? And so, you know, when you ride the motorcycle, you got to turn. You ought to see me on that motorcycle. I was sitting up trying to, with my own mic, turn the motorcycle. <laughs> because it felt like the motorcycle is going to go one way, I'm going to go, and I, I, I want to control the thing. I didn't understand. That it's just like a car. You take the bike and you make the bike do what you want it to do. You flow with the bike. You, you can't take the bike. But, but you know, when you, when you first get on it, you're not accustomed to it. You don't know how to ride it, so it's funny. It feels funny, and you have to learn. So they were teaching us all the do's and don'ts on the motorcycle, what to do. So I, I remember I got on this motorcycle. You know, I, I just want to, I just want to learn this thing, man. And I got on the motorcycle, and uh, uh, the instructor was talking to me. Now. I didn't understand, and I understand about a clutch with a car, but I didn't understand too much with the bike yet. And so he's talking to me. I got off the motorcycle and he's talking to me. I got my hand on the on the on the uh I got my hand on the on the the the, 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 the stuff that the no the where you give it power and I yeah and I got my hand on the clutch and he's talking to me. I ain't thinking. Next thing my hand got off the clutch. And when my hand got off the clutch, oh. this hand went in power. I was off the bike. <laughs> and the motorcycle yanked me. Look, I don't know for how long, but this though, when I finally let the bike go, I flipped over. Good thing I had a helmet on. And the motorcycle fell behind me. Good thing it didn't fall on me. I probably it did. I don't know, but... But now, I'm telling you that to tell you this. I'm telling you that. This, this is my point. I didn't know how to ride. And since I didn't know how to ride, I needed instruction. You see? I needed to learn how the bike works. Just because I am adult, I could have came on there and said, look, you can't tell me nothing. I'm 30 years old, man. I'm a grown man. Yeah, you're a grown man. And you kill yourself being a grown man. You need somebody to tell you something. You don't know everything. So, you know, I'm, I'm there with the bike. And, and, and the guy had to teach me. He had to instruct me. Even with that, I didn't go home. I asked the guy, I said, man, did I fail? <laughs> I said, let's get back on this bike. I need to get my license. You see what I'm saying? What I'm saying is I hadn't used it much. I didn't know because I didn't have, have much use in the bike. You follow me? So the first time, the second time, the third time, all of that was new. But the more I did it, the easier it became. Amen. After a while, through much use, now it started to come normal to me. And so the next time I went back, it was, it was in the bank. You were, boy, I was like, bring it on here. I know what I'm doing. Come on here. Why? Because I've, I've had some training now. So the stuff that I was having a hard time doing, I knew now how to just be one with the bike. See, I need to be one with the motorcycle. So when you turn, you turn with the bike. You turn with the bike. You don't sit up this trying to turn the bike. No, you turn with the bike. You follow me? You see that? Now all you folks are laughing at my expense. You know, I shouldn't have to tell you all this, but you know, it makes sense, right? So, so what happened is through use. I learned what not to do. I learned what to do by using. The more I did it, I realized what works and what doesn't work. What doesn't work will kill me. What works will preserve my life. 
The same thing with the Bible. If you don't learn the word of God, then the devil can eat your lunch. Amen. If you don't understand how the word works, Satan will eat your lunch. Yes, he will. He'll take advantage of you. He don't feel sorry for nobody. You have to learn God's way and God's word. And the more you use it, the better off you are. Look at a couple of more scriptures and we'll close. Look at uh, Ephesians. Go there. Quick, 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 quick. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at this stuff here. Ephesians 5. <clears throat> Ephesians 4. See that? By reason of use. How do I know the Bible works? Work it. Work it. If you're telling me it don't work, work it. Pull it out and work it. Make, out, make God out to be a liar. Pull it out and work it. Work it. Say, okay, God, I'm going to work this thing. And if it doesn't work, then you're lying. And I guarantee you, you'll never find him to be a liar. Because it'll work for you. Look at the Ephesians 4 and verse, uh, verse, verse 11. Look at it. And he gave some apostles. <clears throat> and he gave some prophets. He gave some to be evangelist and some pastors and teachers why look at this for the perfecting or the maturity of the saints for the work of the ministry notice this the work of the ministry precedes the maturity of the saints because the church is not going to readily do the things God wants them to do if they are not mature an immature Christian is what you call a fleshly Christian. An immature Christian is basically a Christian that's looking out for themselves. See that? A mature Christian is one who begins to look after the needs of the Father. Is that right? No different than us growing up, right? Huh? You got kids, your, your immature kids do what? They're just looking out for themselves. They don't have, they don't feel like they have any obligations, right? They could have obligations, but they're not taking care of them, right? When they become matured and understand that you have to do what? You have to take care of your obligation. Part of maturity is handling your obligation. If you got bills, pay them, right? Amen. Same thing here. He says, he says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, how long? Is that going to be going on? Verse, verse 13. Till we all come where? Into the unity of the faith. Maturity in the kingdom. Now you begin to see me as the body and I'll begin to see you as part of the body. <clears throat> we don't deal with each other the way the world tells us to deal with each other. We begin to deal with each other according to the word and the spirit of Christ. You see, we begin to love each other and lay our lives down for each other. Maturity in the kingdom. We begin to handle the word of God and handle the resources that God put into our lives according to God's plan and purpose for our lives. It's maturity in the kingdom. We begin to activate the word and use the word of God according to God's plan and pattern for our lives. You begin to learn how to do it. Does this, does this make sense? Amen. Yes. So the Bible said the, the immature is unskillful in the word. The immature don't know how to use the word. You see, if you don't know how to use the word, especially when you're dealing with difficult situations, you will faint in your own heart. If God doesn't come when you think he ought to come, you will faint and you'll give up. And my, my teaching and message is that you can stand. You can, you, can, you can be constant with God even when situations doesn't make sense. When life has dealt you a hard blow. Life is not fair, folks. Difficult things happen to all of us in life. But you got to hang in there. You got to stick with the word of God. You got to work the word until the word works for you. Amen. You got to work it. If you give up, 
real, sometimes we give up when the answer is on the way. Sometimes Christians give up because they don't understand faith. And they think faith is some ethereal, some, some stuff out there in space. You know, ain't, ain't nothing there. But faith is not putting your trust in some object. Faith is putting your trust in the living God, a person that you come to know. Faith is not asking God to do something outside of his character or who he is. Faith is understanding who God is, what God demands, and you following God and knowing without a shadow of a doubt that God will perform what you're asking him. Amen. If you don't know that, you won't have confidence. Mark chapter 1 verse 41, the, 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 the guy with the... With, with the uh, 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 um, with the sickness, he said, Lord, if it's your will, you can heal me. He didn't know what God's will is. People say, you pray if it's God's will. No, you don't. No, you don't. You only pray if it's God's will when you're consecrating yourself. He said, Father, if it's your will for me to go to Timbuktu, then I'll go to Timbuktu. Whatever your will is for me, Father, I will do that. Because it's not written there. You don't know. But when you're talking about the revealed will of God, you need to know what that is. <laughs> The God said, if it's your will, because he didn't know. Jesus stretched forth his hand and touched him and said, I will. For you and I to know. I will be thou clean. And the guy was clean. When it comes to sickness and disease, it's always God's will to heal you. It's never God's will not to heal. It's always God's will to bless you. It's always as he's your father. Why wouldn't he want to bless you? Why wouldn't he want to help you? Now, some things we may want, we may not be ready for. So we may have to wait a while for it. But it doesn't mean God's telling you, no, you can't have it. Is that, is that right? <clears throat> All right. Uh, uh, Acts chapter 20 and verse 22, it says this. It says, but there is another urgency before me now. Uh, this is in the Message Bible. <laughs> Uh, it says, I feel, comp oh no, no, Let, let's go to the King James, Acts 20 and verse 22, Paul speaking the same way, because what he's saying, so you, you got to stand folks, you got to stand up, you, you can't give in, you can't quit, Paul, Paul said this in verse 24, it, verse 20, I'm sorry, uh, verse, what did I say, Acts what? 20 verse 22 says, and now behold, I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Watch what he said. Say that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city. Watch this now. That trouble is waiting for me. The, you know, the Holy Spirit didn't tell him not to go because he needed to go. But the Holy Spirit said, I'm telling you, trouble is coming. Look what Paul said. He said, none of these things move me. None of these things move me. Listen to me. You see, you see what he's saying here? He said, none of these things move me. I'm not moved by that. I'm going to be steadfast where? In my faith. Amen. I'm going to be steadfast in my faith. I'm not going to run because it gets hot. He said, none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. He said, I'm not serving myself. Amen. So I'm not holding on to my life. Who's got your life? Jesus got your life. He said, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I've received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. You see that? Look, look, man, in life, you got to have some stick to it. You got to be able to stick with God sometime when, when it gets difficult. If you, if you give up, the Bible says if you give up, your strength is small. You see? You have to be able to hang in there. It's not everything God tells you to do. It's just going to just happen just because God told you. No. Sometimes the enemy is going to fight you and you have to know what God says and what to fight with to remain. Amen. Amen. Uh, uh, John, 1 John 5 and verse 4, it says every, every God begotten person conquers the world ways or the world's ways. The conquering power that brings the world to his knees is our faith. The person who wins out over the world's ways is simply the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Amen. See that? Say, you're, you're, uh, the, uh, let's see here, the, the King James, 
<clears throat> the King James Version, it says, Who is he that overcometh the world? Verse 5. But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Listen, your faith overcomes the world. Your faith overcomes the system of this world. You see what I'm saying? You and I are not here to be victimized or to be victims. Then, then, then look at this. Oh my goodness, look at this. In, in uh, Joshua chapter 1, you can look at verse 6 and 7 and verse 18. And we end right here. Joshua 1, 6 and 17. Joshua is the book where they are going in to take the promise that God had promised them. Look at this now. They're going to get to, 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 they're going in the land and they're going to run the enemy out and they're going to take their land. Uh, figuratively speaking for us, that is when you possess now the promises that God provided for you. In order for Joshua to do this, look at what God tells them. God tells them in verse 6 and 7, be strong and of good courage. Notice what God tells them. In verse 6 and 7, God said, Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shall you divide an inheritance of the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Verse 7, Only be thou strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commands you. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper whithersoever you go. Look at verse 18. Whoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandments and will not hearken unto thy words in all that you commanded him, he shall be put to death. Only be strong. You, you think God was trying to tell us something? Look how much time he repeats it. <coughs> and when he tells you be strong, he's not talking about your, your natural frame. He's not telling you to go to the gym and pick up weights. Amen. I mean, you ought to do that. But that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about be strong in your faith. Be strong in your faith to where your faith produces courage. It produces steadfastness in your life. You see, your faith gives you the tenacity to stand firm upon the promise of God, knowing that God will not turn away from you. God will answer you. That's what he's saying to him. In chapter 14, Caleb said, I know I'm old. I'm 80 years old now. But give me my mountain. Give me what God promised me. He said, I am just as strong now as I was 40 years ago. Are you kidding me? You 80 years old, man. Don't tell Caleb that. Caleb didn't know that. Caleb said, look, God's power has made me strong now than I was 40 years ago. Give me my mountain. I'll go in there and I'll chase them devils out of there. Amen. See what I'm talking about? That's how God wants us to be in our faith. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You're not scared even when you feel afraid. You got to talk to the devil and say, no, you devil of fear, no. I got faith in God. God gives me courage, not fear. And courage doesn't mean you won't have fear. Courage doesn't mean the absence of fear. It means in the face of fear, you still move forward. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. So the triumph of your faith, folks. Faith triumphs. Faith triumphs. You remain steadfast and faith will take you through. And it will take you through on the other side. But you have to hang in there with God. Amen. Lord, I thank you tonight. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I, I know it has encouraged the people who are listening to it. And Lord, you have spoken to them personally. Uh, and you have pointed out specific things in their life. <coughs> We all are at different places in life and we all are encountering different situations and difficulties. But as the scripture says, uh, you win. If you walk with the Lord and you hang in there, you win. It's not a matter of you losing. You win. You have already won. In Christ, you win. You don't lose in Christ. You win. You say, brother, you know what you're talking about. 
I've lost this, I've lost that, I've lost the other. Listen to me. I've lost things too and God gave them back to me. You understand what I'm saying? Walking with God is more than just materialism. It's more than that. Are you hearing me? But God is true to his word. If you don't get anything else I say tonight, you can take this to the bank. God is true to his word. And he will back his word. Amen? Lord, I, I, I bless the people in, uh, in Facebook and, and the people that are listening up to us tonight. We bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And we just, we just pray God's strength, God's protection, God's provision in your life. We pray that God will enrich you and fill you to overflowing, my friend. The Lord loves you. He cares about you. We love you. Thank you for tuning in with us tonight. The Lord bless you and keep you. And we'll see you on uh, next week at 7 o'clock. Okay, I love you in the Lord Jesus. Thank you so much. Look, if you have any questions for us that you want us to entertain over there, please drop us a line. Tell us uh, uh, what God's done for you. Just drop us a line and... and uh, uh, give us your questions and we'll make sure we answer you. And when we are online like this, you can always put your question up on there and, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll entertain your questions, okay? But uh, we love you.